All right, so this is the start of the video lecture on chapter seven. Uh, <clears throat> in the last chapter, we talked about uh, concepts of energy and work, and we uh, primarily were using the work kinetic energy theorem to solve our problems. Uh, what we are going to do now is we're now transitioning fully into conservation of energy. So we are not going to consider the work that's done by different forces. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to think about those forces and we're going to break them up into things. Some of those forces have associated potential energies. Some of them are sort of dissipated forces like friction or some things like that. So we're going to separate these things so we can have a true conservation of energy concept here. So what you see at the top is the sort of the idea of what we call the energy equation. And that if we look at the changes that occur in kinetic energy and the changes that occur in all the different potential energies, plus any e-thermal, and e-thermal is just energy that's transferred uh, you know, be between objects in the system, but it's taken away from um, the kinetic and the potential energies. And, and for what we do, e-thermal will pretty much always take the form of friction. Okay, And so um, you know, we'll work on that a bit later. Uh, the combination of delta K and delta U is what we call delta E mechanical. So the sum of kinetic and potential energies is what we refer to as the mechanical energy of our system. Uh, and so when we combine the mechanical energy and we combine the thermal energy, that's the total change in the system energy. And that's equal to zero if we have an isolated system. If we do not have an isolated system, then that's going to be equal to the external work. So that means that if work is being done on the system that will increase its energy, delta E will be positive because the work is positive or vice versa. Uh, the, the system does work in the environment, so energy is removed from the system and then we have negative work and so delta E cis will be negative. So this equation is kind of all encompassing, um, but we're going to simplify it down a bit and then I'll develop it as we move through this lecture here. But for the first two examples, we're not going to consider any e-thermal, and we're not going to consider any external work being done. So really what's going on here is delta K plus delta U will be equal to zero. And you can write that in the form that you see at the bottom here, where you can characterize the kinetic and the potential energy of the system initially, and then at some later time we look at how the kinetic energy and potential energies have changed. And um, if it's truly an isolated system, um, and there's no dissipative forces, um, <clears throat> then these quantities are equal to each other. And just to be clear in this equation here, if you say K initial and U initial, we're talking about all of the objects in the system. So, if, for example, we'll, you know, in the picture over here, we have three objects in our system. So we might have three kinetic energy terms, and we might have three potential energy terms. It just really depends on how many things we're talking about. Okay, so the only potential energy we've really dealt with so far is gravitational potential energy. And there was something a little tricky about gravitational potential energy. And what's tricky about it is that it can be zero and it can be negative because it's mgy. Okay, that's what the potential energy is. So let me just remind you of how that looks. So ug, and I'll just kind of put it right here actually equals mgy, where y is uh, a distance, right? Some distance. But what's important about this is because you can have a zero and you could have negative, we actually need to find a zero point for potential energy. We have to decide what position the potential energy is going to be zero. You know, we didn't have this concern when we did kinetic energy because the zero point's pretty clear. It's when the speed is zero. So there's no reason to, to change that at all. But here, it's a little tricky how we talk about things. So an individual value for potential energy doesn't really have a lot of meaning. It really, the what really matters is the change of the potential energy. So in the example here, um, these uh, two people have decided to define different zero points for the uh, characterizing the potential energy of this rock. Uh, in the picture here, Ambrose decided that the zero point is going to be on the ground. And so because it's on the ground, uh, having the rock, a one kilogram rock, one meter up, means that the rock will possess 
9.8 joules of uh, gravitational potential energy. Okay, M is 1, G is 9.8, Y is 1. And at the bottom, it would be 0. Uh, Bill says, no, I don't want to do that. Actually, I'm, I'm, I want to characterize the, um, the zero point when it starts. So I'm going to say the zero point is meter up. And so when it falls, it will actually be uh, losing potential energy, but that means it will become more negative. So when it reaches the ground, it will be at a negative 9.8. Okay, so Bill's initially saying, oh, the potential energy of this rock is zero. Now, is either of them right? No. They're both, wait, yeah, they're both right. No, they're both right. They're both right. But what will happen is when the rock falls and then they talk to each other and say, well, how much did the rock change in potential energy? They'll both have the same answer. They'll both say that it lost 9.8 joules. Okay. This is just like a coordinate system, right? You just got to decide where you want zero to be. And how do you know where to choose zero? Well, you choose zero for convenience. Really, the zero is about, you know, making the problem easier to imagine, making your math easier. I mean, the zero point really can be anywhere. You want to choose a zero point that just hopefully makes your life easier. All right. Let's jump into our first problem here. Oops. All right. So let's bring up the first problem here. All right. The first problem is a problem that we already know how to do. It's a kinematic problem. We've already worked this stuff out, but we're going to do it in the context of energy now. So the boy reaches out of a window, tosses the ball straight up with a speed of 10 meters per second. The ball is initially 20 meters above the ground as he releases it. So here we go. We got our window down here, 20 meters up. We're going to toss this ball into the air. It's going to reach some maximum height, and then it's going to fall and hit the ground. And um, <clears throat> so the very first thing you want to do in all your energy problems is where's the zero point? Um, ground's always a natural place to put it. I decided I'm going to do the ground. So let's do the ground. Down here is y equals zero. Window is up at y equals 20. And now I've got to answer these questions here. We want to find the ball's maximum height above the ground. Okay, so you got to go back and remember how kinematics works here. Um, you know, if you're, again, you're thinking about the energy, and there's only two energies here. There's kinetic energy and there's potential energy. So we got to think about how that's changing, right? So I have here my energy transformation. My energy transformation is kinetic to potential energy. And the idea is that the object, as it goes up, loses kinetic energy and it gains potential energy. And so I can create my energy equation. I can characterize the ball's initial kinetic and initial gravitational. And then at some later time, and the later time will be on its max height, you have the kinetic energy, potential energy. So just to be clear about these two, this equation here, what's on the left-hand side, the initial stuff, is a snapshot in time, okay? I'm characterizing what the ball's energy is at a moment in time. And then I do it again at some later time and I want to characterize its kinetic potential energy. And you know, one of these terms obviously is going to be an unknown, and we'll solve for it. So the two points in time that we're considering is as the ball is released and at the very top of the trajectory. Okay. So let's look at how that goes. Now, the kinetic energy of the ball, 1 half mv squared. Okay. Uh, it has some initial speed. Um, it does have an initial gravitational potential energy because I've characterized the ground to be zero. So uh, there's an MGY here. Now, again, if we go back to kinematics, remember how you know things behave when they get to their max height. They have no speed, right? So the kinetic energy at the top is zero. And uh, we're going to have some new gravitational potential energy, MGY final. Uh, the masses drop out here. Um, you put in your numbers. Velocity is 10. This position here is 20. We solve for, for uh, y final, and we get 25. So the ball apparently goes up five, five meters. All right. We let's go to part B. We want to find the ball's speed as it passes the window on its way down. Okay. So again, something you remember from kinematics is that if you toss a ball into the air, if there's no air resistance, toss anything into the air really, with an initial speed, it will go up, and as it comes down, when it gets back to the same height it will have the same speed. 
So our energy transformation here is nothing, nothing at all, okay? You could, and you could sort of see why this is. If you look at this gravitational potential energy here and the final one, they're going to be identical because the positions are identical. That means the kinetic energies must be the same. So there's no change in energy. There's no energy transformation. Delta Y is zero. So the speed is 10. Oh, obviously, it's going down though now. Okay. We want to find the speed of the ball upon impact. So um, energy transformation here is going to be gravitational energy into kinetic energy. And again, two snapshots in time. What I'm going to do is my initial stuff is still going to be at the window. I'm going to keep everything right here. And then my final is going to be where on the ground. All right. So I have my initial and my uh, initial kinetic and potential energies. So the velocity here will be 10. The position here is 20. And um, uh, when we look at what's going on, on the ground, well, when we reach the ground, the position is zero. So there is no gravitational potential energy, but there is a little bit more kinetic. So the object lost some gravitational energy and it was put into kinetic energy. Masses drop out here, put in your numbers, we get a velocity. It's a little bit higher, 22 meters per second. So this is a really simple, really straightforward, really great illustration of uh, how we utilize real simple energy conservation stuff. And again, this is a problem that we already know how to do. Um, and uh, as I sort of mentioned previously, some students have a sort of a mixed opinion about energy. Some people see this and they're like, oh, the math is so simple. This is fantastic. And some see, some look at this and say, I don't really get the concepts too well. And so even though the math's easier, I'd rather have harder math and less concept. And so I don't know what, what category you will fall in. Maybe you have the category of, I don't get either, but <laughs> hopefully, um, the point of energy in my opinion is that, yeah, it's conceptually stronger. Um, and the math is easier and I, I personally like that. I want, I don't like, well, I mean, I love math, but I like more concepts, honestly. All right, let's move on from here. Oh, I think I have another example right away. Straight away, another example I do. All right, let's get back to that then. So the second example has us look at a problem that was not a fun problem in kinematics. Uh, you might remember a problem like this, uh, what's happening here, and I'll draw this out just in case it's not clear what's happening here. But we got a cliff. Oh, no, we got a wall, I guess, some kind of wall. So we got a 10-meter wall here, okay, 10 meters up. We got some cannon, and it's shooting a ball up here. So ball's being shot at about 30-degree angle. Make it 30. Ah, that's probably 30. And then, of course, what happens is the ball is shot. That's that's pretty terrible. That's not good. Anyway, that's basically right. So, um, you know, if you remember this problem here back in Kinemax, it was it was rather obnoxious. You'd have to sort of work out, you know, how uh, you know shot into the air. You got to look at the y component of velocity. You got to figure out, you know, how long is it going to take to drop 10 meters. Then you go into the, then you have to go into the, um, into uh, the x direction equations, and then you have, based on that time, you have to work out how far it goes. And then you know where it goes, but then after you get the time, then you have to go and work out what the speed in y and x is in this Pythagorean theorem. To get, I mean, it's just it's just a, a huge pain. To do this problem, but with energy, it is really simple. So, uh, because the nice thing about energy is no vectors. There's no vectors at all. So this simplifies um, how we characterize some things like speed. Anyway, what's the energy transformation here? Well, this object is being shot into the air, and then it falls to a lower height. So that means we're losing some gravitational potential energy, and we're gaining some kinetic. I'm going to make the zero point the ground here. So the initial stuff here this is when the right as the cannon is launched and this stuff here is when it hits the ground and you know when it comes to kinetic energy we only care about the overall speed we don't look we don't care about the components of speed um, so we can ignore that completely same thing with potential energy the only thing we care about is how high or how low it goes there's nothing about x direction in gravitational potential energy you can ignore everything about the x direction here uh, and what that tells you is this is equivalent of just basically dropping 
I mean, th this problem is completely identical to just saying we're at the say we're at the top of our fortress wall and we just hold, um, you know, the the cannon here and we just throw it down at 80 meters per second, or, or we throw it up at 80 meters per second, or something like that. I mean, that's just technically an identical problem. Anyway, so um, our speed initially is 80, right? Uh, we don't need the mass. All the masses all drop out. Uh, speed's 80. Initial height's 10. We're going to solve for our later speed. We have no potential energy when we hit the ground because we've said the zero point is the ground. And so you solve this, and you get also just a slightly larger speed, 81 meters per second. Okay, so that problem was a lot easier in energy. And again, this is sort of the reason why we're doing energy. Is certain problems that were very challenging before become very, very simple when we do energy. All right, let's get back to this then. Don't look at the answers. All right, <clears throat> ah, we want to rank in order from largest to smallest to gravitational potential energy of the balls here, okay? So, uh, at point three, the, the ball has zero speed. So think about this for a moment. You may want to pause the video, but the answer here is D. Three has the largest potential energy, two and four equal, one is the smallest. Where is the zero point here? Well, does it matter where the zero point is here? Okay, uh, ranking gravitational energies um, ultimately doesn't need a zero point. Zero points matter when we are looking at a transformation taking place. This is just a snapshot in time. And uh, the principle here is three is the highest up. So if you're the highest up, you have the most gravitational energy. It doesn't matter if, if we say the zero point is at three either. We could say the zero point's right at three. It doesn't change our answers. No, zero points right there, maybe. Oh, what am I doing? Say the zero points right here. Does that change the answer? No, it doesn't. Because two and four will have negative potential energy. It'll still be technically smaller. One it would be even smaller. So ultimately what matters here is how high you are off the uh, off the ground. All right. Another problem here. We got a 1,500 kilogram car traveling 10 meters per second runs out of gas while approaching the dip shown below. Can the vehicle reach the gas station? And if so, what speed will it have? So what's going to happen to the car here? Well, the car is going to go down the ramp. Not ramp. The car is going to go down this little hill here. It's going to reach the bottom. And it's going to come back up. And hopefully, we don't know. We're going to figure this out. If it can get up to the gas station. It's a strange gas station. Just build it down here. But it will go up here. We need to figure out if it makes it or not, All right? So a lot of things to consider here. Uh, when you do conservation of energy, in your mind, you're thinking a couple things here. Zero point. And the other thing you want to think about is what are your snapshots in time here? What are you considering to be the start and the finish? Now, the start is pretty clear here. It starts going to be when the car is up at 10 meters right here. The question becomes, what is my second point in time. Okay, so where, where, where do you want to choose a second point in time here? Now, a lot of students say, well, how about right there? We want to know what the car does up here, then it goes down here, and then we'll do another energy problem where we go from here to up here. Well, I would say that's not a great idea because one thing that's really beautiful about energy is the snapshots in time. And, and what happens is, if you don't have any dissipative forces, if you don't have any external work being done, um, the transfer of energy is always happening. And what that means is, you can there can be things that happen intermediately. And we ultimately don't care about that. So um, the fact that the car goes down initially is totally irrelevant for us. Um, I'm not going to consider what happens down here at all because I don't need to. All right, so let's look at how this problem is solved. All right, so let's look at how this problem is being solved here. Our energy transformation here is we have our kinetic energy. It's going to be uh, leaving, and we're going to be gaining in potential energy. All right, that's the energy transformation. Notice that I've chosen my zero point at 10 meters. I did not choose it um, at the ground, well, the bottom of the hill, I would say, because I'm not going to consider any positions down there. I'm going to try to make the math easier for myself, and I'm going to make the zero point at 10 meters. So um, 
the way I'm going to approach this problem is I'm going to assume we go up 5 meters, and I'm going to check the speed. Now, if I get a positive value for the speed, I know we made it. Um, if, uh, if we didn't make it, what happens is you try to solve for the speed, and you're going to get a, a negative under, under the radical, uh, which means obviously you did not make it. So um, our in initial kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Uh, the v is 10 meters per second. Okay, now I have my mass here. I don't, I don't need the mass. Uh, the mass is in every term, cancels out. Uh, at some later time, the time is going to be when we reach the gas station, um, the value for y will be 5, not 15, 5, because zero points at 10 meters. Okay, so we go 5 meters up. So this y is going to be 5, and I'm going to solve for the velocity here. And if you do that, you get 1.4, which means we do make it, and when we get to the top, we're going to be coasting at 1.4. That's nice. Now, on the right here, I've decided to do a, a slightly different treatment here. This is the other way they approach the problem. And the other way they approach the problem is to say, well, um, let's try to figure out how high we can go uh, when we come to a stop. So let's imagine that the hill doesn't stop at 5 uh, meters higher. Let's just say it just keeps going up, and I'm just going to figure out how high we can go. And and what you're checking here is that can, can you get up 5 meters? If, if you get a value that's 5 or greater, you make it. If you get a value under 5, you didn't make it clearly. So... Um, so that you know your your initial stuff is still the same, but the final stuff is we're going to make the potent, uh, sorry the kinetic energy zero, and then we're going to solve for some height that we could reach if all of the kinetic energy is gone and we get five point one meters. So uh, all, that's all we have to do. We have to get up five point one meters, and all we need to do is get up five, so we definitely can make it. So a couple of different approaches here, but that's how you'd want to do that one. Uh, the reason why I'm illustrating this problem is because a lot of students do decide to work it out into two steps down at the bottom, and then up. And you don't need to do that. And you definitely don't need to do that. You're just looking at two snapshots in time. Okay. Let's get back to the lecture here. All right. So um, in this example here, we're going to be looking a little bit more at, at potential energy and kinetic energy. So we start from rest, and a marble first rolls down a steeper hill, then down a less steep hill of the same height, for which is... It's going to be faster at the bottom. So think about this for a moment. You may want to pause. But the answer here is C. The speed is the same at the bottom of both hills. Now, if you look at the energy transformation for these two balls, they're the same. They both possess pot gravitational potential energy, and they have the same gravitational potential energy because they're at the same height. And then what happens is the ball will roll down, and that is transferred into kinetic energy. And so when they reach the bottom, because they had the same potential energy to begin with, and they're going to have the same potential energy at the end, they're both going to have the same increase in kinetic energy. And if they're the same mass, which we're going to assume they are, uh, then they're going to have the same speed, right? Now, there's a difference here, though. A slight difference and it's a difference that energy doesn't care about and these two balls have one thing that is different with them and that's time the ball on the left will reach it faster than the ball on the right i mean you could sort of imagine this imagine that the ball on the left was just dropped there was no there was no incline it just drops and the other one has to roll down well obviously the one that drops is going to hit faster I mean, sorry hit sooner um, so there's a time issue here, at, but energy does not care about time. So we don't see that here. In fact, if this was a kinematic problem, you'd have to work out, okay, you know, what's the acceleration based on the ramp angle, and there are different ramp angles here. So, and then you can work out time from there. So we could figure out the time if you want to, but ultimately we're just trying to figure out what's going faster. All right, moving on. All right, you got different slides here, and we're trying to figure out what the fastest speed is going to be at the bottom. All right, so think about this for a moment, and the answer is going to be D. Okay, so hopefully, my hope is that your feeling at this point is, duh, and can we move on already? <laughs> and if you're at that point, then that's good. I'm hammering this notion into your head here, and so... If you feel that way, that means uh, I've probably communicated what I need to communicate. 
So yeah, the speeds are the same, but there's some differences here. I mean, like, you know, you, the kid at C is going to be pretty happy, probably. The kid at D is going to be not so happy here. That's not a great slide. <laughs> All right. A is a pretty gnarly slide, too. Um, there's some differences among these, obviously, and it's similar to the ramp issue. You notice when you actually have slides, though, you know, they don't look like this. Well, sometimes they look like C, though. I don't understand why they do that. It's kind of dramatic. But you see slides are more sort of kind of curve more. And the point of that is that friction is really at work here. And what you're doing is you're sort of increasing the path length. And you're allowing friction to make sure this kid doesn't hit the ground at like 30 miles an hour. So, um, yeah, the most dangerous slide would be the one that just kind of does that. That's not a great slide. <laughs> All right, clear. Moving on. Okay, well, I'm not done. I'm sorry. I'm not done with my questions here. I got more. Uh, three balls are thrown from a cliff with the same speed but at different angles. Okay, which ball has the greatest speed before it hits the ground? All right, think about that for a moment. The answer is D. Okay, maybe this is overkill now. Maybe this is overkill. Uh, but, you know, just to be clear here, energy transformation, gravitational potential energy to kinetic. Now, it, the ball possesses gravitational energy, because we'll, we'll say the ground is a zero point here, and it has, and it has kinetic energy, but the energy transformation is interested in how it transforms. So the gravitational energy goes down and the kinetic energy goes up. And because all three of these balls fell the same distance down, they will have the same speed. It doesn't matter how they're launched. Okay. What's different? Again, time is different. But other than that, they have the same speed. Okay. There's another question I'm going to skip it because this is, this is a little... Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, now we're going to take a, we're going to kind of kind of get off, well, not get off topic, but we're going to try to, I'm going to introduce this, this sort of miscellaneous idea here um, of Hooke's Law. Because, you know, when we introduced forces, we talked a bit about spring force. And I did introduce a spring force when we first talked about forces, but we never really did anything with the spring force. And the reason why is because spring forces are a little more complicated and uh, to properly incorporate them into forces, the whole force chapters, uh, mathematically it's a little more difficult. It's uh, technically a second order differential equation, not incredibly difficult to solve, but nonetheless we don't do differential equations at this point. So, but with energy, spring forces are very easy to do. So I'm going to first talk about the, what the force is like, and then we'll talk about what the energy is like. So Hooke's Law is basically a statement on how basic restoring forces work. It doesn't have to be springs. It has to be what's simply a restoring force. So if you look at the diagram in the upper right here, this is what we mean by a restoring force. This particular thing is a spring. It doesn't have to be a spring. It could be anything that's considered elastic or anything that can return to equilibrium, but I'm going to use a spring as my example here. The spring initially has a equilibrium length to it that we'll call an L0 and currently has no force. If you attempt to stretch the spring out, um, you're going to create a force that's going to try to bring it back to equilibrium. This is why we would call a restoring force. It tries to restore to equilibrium. And so the force is going to be to the left here because our displacement is to the right. If you compress the spring, you have the opposite taking place, where if we compress it and the displacement is to the left, it, the force will be to the right. So the situation that you have here is that your force and your displacement are always opposite each other, and that's why in Hooke's Law we have a negative sign here to indicate that the force and the displacement are always opposite of each other. Okay. So the magnitude of your spring force is based on how much displacement took place and a spring constant. That's what this K is here. K is a spring constant, okay? Now the spring constant is basically a measure of how elastic the spring is. It is given in units of newtons per meter. 
So what that tells you is when you say you compress a spring with a certain distance, this converts that into a force. Okay, so for example, you know, in the example that we have here, we have our spring that's been pulled to different distances, and we've measured what kind of force that spring is exerting. This is a linear relationship, that's what Hooke's Law basically is. And uh, here we're simply interested in the, the mathematical numbers. So there's no negative sign here just because we're just interested in how that slope looks. So technically all of these values here are, you know, they're negative, but we're just going to keep them positive for the example here. But the slope is uh, 3.5 newtons per meter. And so what that's telling us is that if we were to compress the spring a meter, if it's somehow that long, um, then the, the force that the spring would exert is, is 3.5 uh, newtons. So if we compressed it, say, to 10 centimeters, it would only be 0.35 and so on. So this is just this is a proportionality constant that simply tells us how elastic the spring is. Now what happens here is if the spring is, you know, very, very loose, you know, like basically like slinky kind of loose, um, you know, the spring comes to be super low. But if you have a very, very tight spring, um, one that doesn't compress or or, uh, or stretch very much, then the spring constant is very, very high. Okay, so uh, that's sort of the meaning behind that. All right, um, now we can consider uh, vertically what's happening with our spring. And you have a similar situation here where you have your spring hanging and there's some equilibrium position. When we attach a mass to it, uh, the mass now exerts a force that's downward and it will stretch the spring out, which will create a spring force that would be opposite the displacement, so it's up now, and the spring is going to stretch until an equilibrium becomes established. And what that does is when these, once the equilibrium is established, we now create a new equilibrium. Um, which we're going to call just L here. That's our new equilibrium position. And, um, and you know, these two forces at the moment here are equal to each other. And so we can very easily establish what that new equilibrium is going to be based on how much uh, the value of gravity is in the situation here. Okay. I'm going to do an example of this in a little bit, but let me have, I have a question for you first. All right, so this is... Um, uh, we're looking at different relationships between displacement and force here. Um, the restoring force here um, is being measured, okay, four different spring constants here. Uh, we want to determine what's the largest spring constant of these. We got that for a minute. Hopefully, you said A. Uh, it's 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 basically you know Hooke's law is F equals K delta X. So K is basically the slope of a linear line. So the steeper it is, uh, the stronger, the, what is it, the larger the spring constant is. And that means, again, the spring is going to be, uh, um, you know, you don't need to stretch it much or compress it much to produce a big force. That's the idea. All right. So <clears throat> let's look at an example here of utilizing uh, you know, gravity with our spring constant here. So let's do that. Where is it? Where is it? It's here. Okay. All right. So um, when there is no mass attached to it, okay, the spring hangs 15 centimeters, is what you see on the left here. And when we attach the 5 kilogram mass to it, uh, we see that it stretches an additional 10 centimeters, okay? So at this point right here is where we have the equilibrium. Gravity's down, spring forces up. They're equal to each other. So here we say that delta K, sorry, K delta Y equals mg. Now, just to be clear here, the delta Y would be negative because it goes down. That's why I don't have a negative in the front. Those cancel out. And we're going to solve for our spring constant here. We know that we're able to go down an extra 10 centimeters by attaching a 5 
uh, kilogram weight to this. So we put our numbers, mass of 5, gravity is 9.8, the displacement is 10 centimeters, got to put it in meters, because your spring constant is always going to be SI, newtons per meter. And we get a, a spring constant of 490 here. Okay, so for every meter this is compressed, we're going to see a... Um, we're going to see a, um, a force of 400 and, uh, 490 newtons. Now, how much did we compress this? Okay, we was, it was a tenth of a meter, right? And so when, what's the weight of this thing, right? The weight of this thing is 49 newtons. So this makes sense, right? Okay. All right, so how long is the spring when a 9 kilogram mass is suspended from it? So we're going to replace the 5 kilogram with a 9 kilogram. And obviously, we expect it to go down a bit farther. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the exact same relationship. We still have the same condition here. Spring force equals gravity. I put it over here. Okay, we have a different mass, though. So we're now we're going to solve for delta y instead of k. And we do this, and we get 18 centimeters. Now, 18 centimeters, however is the displacement from the original equilibrium. So, you know, imagine we were over here with the 15 centimeters. We put the nine kilogram down and it goes all the way down an additional 18. This is a delta Y. If you attach the mass, what it's telling you is how much you displace from your original equilibrium. So the question, not exactly tricky, but you do need to be we need to pay close attention to what's being asked. This is how long is the spring, not how much it stretches out. So we have to add in the original 15 to get 33 centimeters. So it will hang 33 centimeters from the ceiling. Okay, that's a, that's a great problem. Okay, that's just basics and how the forces work here. Let's get back. All right, so the whole reason... We're really talking about this is because we're you know it, solving force problems with Hooke's law is, is a little challenging. Um, although at the very end of the class, when we work on oscillations, we don't have any choice. We're going to have to work with it as a force, and we will have to look at a, a very basic differential equation, which I'm never going to ask you to really to solve. I'll solve it for you and just tell you what the solutions are. But um, what we can do is we can do energy things with this. And, um, and you know, the spring force is a type of, well, it's a kind of force that we, in physics, we call a, a conservative force. And I'm going to say more about conservative forces in the next lecture. But one of the things about conservative forces is that uh, they have an associated potential energy that goes with them. So gravity is a conservative force. And so what that means is, is that when you transfer energy back and forth from, say, potential, gravitational potential to other things, the energy is going to be conserved. That's why we call it a conservative force. Um, and same thing is true with elastic potential energy. If we stretch springs out or compress them, um, you know, that energy is always being converted to other forms and it can always be put back. It's a conservative force. Examples of things that are not conservative forces are things like friction. Um, if, you know, if energy is being dissipated by friction, you can't get it back. So the energy is not conserved in those situations, at least for the system that you're considering, the isolated system you're considering. Um, and so uh, we call those a non-conservative force, right? Um, but ultimately, because your force is dependent on the position, uh, when things are in motion, you don't have a constant acceleration. So kinematics doesn't work for us, and a lot of force things don't work for us. But in energy, we're okay with not having constant acceleration. We're okay ignoring issues in time. We're totally fine with that. So let's look at how this is done. All right, so... What we're going to do here is we're going to look at this. If we go back to the expression here, Hooke's Law, okay? We're trying to imagine how we can get the energy out of that. And the way we get the energy out of that is the following here. Now, ignore what it says here about the equation of motion. You don't know about that yet, and you won't know about that for a while. But let's actually bring up something 
that we can do. What we can do is we can go back to the last chapter. We can say, let's look at work. Let's see how work works here. I can't say that. All right, so we got, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's not a bad integral sign. Look at that. All right, work equals force. This is our integral definition of work, f dx, right? And if we're considering here the work that's being done, this is positive work, right? The spring's compressed, and then it starts to release. So it does positive work on the ball here. And so what that will do is it will increase the kinetic energy of it. Okay, so we know from the work kinetic energy theorem that this is equal to delta k. All right. So what do we put in for our force? Well, what we put in for the force is k delta x. Now the delta x here, okay, was it was negative when we did this. Okay, so the force is obviously directed to the right. So I don't have to worry about the negative sign anymore because we've because we had we had to compress it initially, and then we let go, and then the force goes to the right now. So in fact, I'm not really going to make this delta x here. In fact, you can just make it a position, but we can integrate this. And if you integrate this, um, then this is your variable right here. Okay, so this has an exponent of one, right? So if you remember, maybe you don't, but the power rule for integration. Um, and I'm doing a very crude way. If a mathematician saw me, they would, they would pass out probably from all the little simplifications and shortcuts I'm making. But anyway, uh, power law stuff here, you add one to the exponent and then you divide by that number. So you would get a square and you get a half in the front. Okay. So, uh, that tells us what the work is. Now, if we also think about, okay. You know, what's this work doing here? Well, it's changed the kinetic energy. And so that actually is going to correspond to our potential energy. Okay, this is this the work that's being done comes from somewhere, right? And it comes from the spring, but that's an associated potential energy. Okay, so what we have up here is this is the familiar K final. All right, this is our K initial here. Okay. And this would be u final and u initial. So, you know, he, the delta k has the initial and final stuff. And then this is an integration. We have limits here. Right? We have an initial position here. And we have a final position here. So we get two terms out of this as well. So this is just rearranging terms after we do our integration here. And we can see that we can arrange things like this. Now, this looks just like the example that we did for... Um, uh, gravitational potential energy. And so we, when we see this, we can say, okay, well, I see this, and I see this. This must be the associated potential energies because it matches perfectly with the equation we had before, and, and, and that is true. And so, you know, here it says we're defining new quantity, and I suppose you could say that. Um, I don't know if defines the right word, really, but whatever. Um, but this is going to be our, uh, our elastic potential energy. So the way you would solve problems that have springs and things like that is just like you would do for um, for gravitational energy. You characterize a before and after picture. So now one thing that's nice about this equation here, it looks a lot like kinetic energy. It, okay, so this thing can't be negative. And the zero point is, is always when delta S is zero. So this is nice like kinetic energy is nice. We don't have the same considerations for uh, kinetic, for uh, elastic potential energy that we do for for uh for, for um, gravitational energy. All right, so let's clear this out and let's look at some examples. I think we have examples now. Oh yeah, so this is our basic energy equation. Now this is if we have This is if we have the spring potential energy. I usually will indicate with like a U S for spring. I'll put a U G for gravitational. By the way, you can mix all three together, and if you mix all three together, you would have an additional gravity term here and gravity term over here. I think I already said all this stuff, though. Yeah, I just said in the last part. So uh, let's move on, I guess. All right. So a spring-loaded gun shoots a plastic ball with a launch speed of 2 meters per second. 
If the swing is compressed twice as far, the ball's launch speed will be what? Think about that for a moment. And the answer is four. All right, so what are we doing here? Well, um, we are compressing it twice as far, right? So compressing it twice as far, there's two squared terms here, right? So having two squared terms means the increase in one, the speed, will correlate directly to the change in the displacement here. So if the delta x goes up by a factor of two, the v goes up by a factor of two. Great. All right, similar question here. Spring-loaded gun shoots a plastic ball with a launch speed of two meters per second. If the spring is replaced with a new spring, having twice the spring constant. So in the last one, we had twice the displacement. Now we want twice the spring constant. And we want to know what the launch speed is here. So think about that for a moment. All right, and the answer here is C. What, what is 2.8? 2.8 is radical two larger than two. Okay, that's what it is, radical, uh, radical two larger than two. It's two times 1.4. And so in the equation here, the velocity is squared, but the K is not. So if you double K and you solve for V, you got to take the square root of that. So if this goes up by a factor of two, that means the speed has to go up by a factor of radical two. And so what this means is the displacement is a larger um, factor here than the spring constant, okay? All right, so um, we're gonna do a, a few examples using spring potential energy. So let's jump right into that. Okay, fantastic. All right, look, there's barely any writing down here. That means it's simple. No, it's not, but uh, it does reveal that. Now, it, it's not seen a lot of writing here is what I said earlier. Conceptually, maybe a little more challenging, mathematically way easier, okay? So a uh, student places her 500 gram physics book on a frictionless table. She pushes the book against the spring, compresses it by four centimeters, then releases the book. What is the book speed? It slides away. All right, energy transformation is this. We possess only spring potential energy, okay? And that it loses that and it turns into kinetic energy, right? There is no gravitational energy to consider here because the motion is purely horizontal. There's no increase or decrease in height. So you could technically put it in there, but it would be the same on either side of the equation, okay? So the left side here is my initial stuff. One thing that you don't see here, I didn't put it in, but technically there's a plus zero here, which is the initial kinetic energy. It doesn't have any of that. So I, don't, I didn't, didn't put it in there. And saving over here, you don't see a final spring potential energy because once it is released from the spring, the spring returns to the equilibrium position all the energy stored in the spring has been put into the book. So that's why you don't see those things on either side. I just didn't write them in because ultimately I'm just taking all of this energy here and turning it into all of this stuff here. So I put in all my numbers, half, 1250 for the spring constant. Just double check that's in newtons per meter. The four centimeters, you got to put in meters, 0 0.04. You won't, you won't, you'll, you'll put in centimeters. That's, that's how everybody does. And I'll make a big stink about it, but you know, centimeters is bad. There's like very, very few situations in physics where you can get away with centimeters. And those situations are when you're just basically dealing with ratios or proportions and the units cancel in any way. But anyway, put it in meters. You won't, but you should. Uh, same thing with this. Got to be kilograms, right? Everything's SI here because of K. K is newtons per meter. Can't do anything about that. You got to keep newtons per meter in there. All right, so that's kilograms. We solve for our speed, we get two meters per second. All right, great. Let's move on here. How much more we got? Oh, we don't got much more. Oh, I'm almost done. Okay, last example here. Oh, this one's good. This one's so good because we're mixing all three together now. We got a 1,000 kilogram safe is two meters above a heavy duty spring when the rope holding the safe breaks. 
the save hits the spring and compresses by 50 centimeters when the spring constant is. Oh my goodness, this is a good problem. All right, let's get into it. Oh, what did I do? Okay. At the top here, it says in-class activity. I used to do in-class activities when our classes were two hours. And then they changed it. All right. Let's see what we're doing with, uh, what we're working with here. Energy transformation. Okay, this is, this is where the concept gets a little challenging here. So here's our energy transformation. Gravitational potential energy, to spring potential energy. Okay. So again, let me, let me just go through the logic of how you should think about all this stuff. Okay. When you're considering energy transformations, you're saying, what things did we possess to begin with that go down? Okay. That is the source of energy. And then when you look on the other side, you say, okay, what things, what energy do we now possess in greater amounts now? So you're basically seeing where the energy comes from and where it goes. So the energy leaves gravitational potential energy and it goes into spring potential energy. Okay. Now, then the next thing you have to think about is this. What is the before and after? When you do energy conservation, there's two snapshots in time, a before and an after. Well, the before is right before we drop the safe here, two meters off from the spring. What I'm going to consider to be afterwards is once it hits a spring and it compresses it. So what will actually happen here is this will drop, it will hit the spring, it will compress it. It actually will go past half a meter. It will oscillate a bit, maybe, and then it will reach an equilibrium. And it'll just stay right there, okay? So, I mean, obviously there's some aspects of this. We're not considering dissipated forces. We're not considering drag or anything like that. We'll just assume that, you know, all the gravitational energy is being converted into uh, the spring potential energy. So that's the before and after picture. And again, energy doesn't care about time. Energy doesn't care about intermediate things. As long as we don't have any dissipative forces here, we don't have any external factors here. We don't care about what happens intermediately. So I don't know exactly how the safe is going to come to its equilibrium. We don't care. Okay. Zero point. I'm going to choose zero point when the safe is, uh, once the safe has compressed it to 50 centimeters. Okay. That's my zero point. So that means in my original problem, the before, we're 2.5 meters up from that location. Now you certainly can choose a zero point to be at in the beginning where the spring is not compressed. My only issue with that, and this, there's no problem doing that, is that you'll have a potential energy before and you'll have a potential energy after. And if I do it the way I set it up here, I don't have a potential energy term at the end. Again, you can have a potential, it's fine. It's not a lot of extra work, but you can do that. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the initial stuff. Initially, I have a bunch of gravitational potential energy. This Y initial is 2.5 because I've called my 0, 0.0 right here, okay, 2.5. I have no spring potential energy to begin with because the spring is not compressed. Because of my choice of 0 point, I have no gravitational potential energy at the end. And I'm gonna, now going to put in here, uh, what am I even looking for? Oh, I'm looking for spring constant, okay. So, uh, and I put in my spring compression here, okay, which is 0.5 meters. Okay, don't put 50 in there, you will but you shouldn't, right? So I got to solve for K, solve for K, I get this thing here, put in all your numbers, 2.5 times another four newtons per meter, okay? And that's how we do it. Now, one thing that you're probably thinking, where is the kinetic energy here? Where is it? Well, it's not here. <laughs> you don't need it. Why? Because all the motion that took place was the intermediate stuff. It happened between the before and after. And when you do energy conservation, you don't care about the intermediate stuff. All you care about is the before and after, again, assuming you have an isolated system, assuming that you know any dissipative forces, if there is drag involved here, they would remove energy and I'd have to work out this differently, which is the next lecture. Um, but as it stands here, there's no reason to invoke kinetic energy. 
This is kind of like the problem with the gas station in the hill. A lot of students will do this. They'll say, okay, I want to work out what the, kinetic, what the kinetic energy is right before it hits, and then I'll take that kinetic energy and I'll turn it into a, uh, a spring potential energy here. And you can do that, but oh my goodness, you're going to make your life so much harder if you do that. Because what happens is when you when, right before you hit the spring here, you now possess some kinetic energy, but you still have some gravitational energy, okay? Because the object's still going to drop another half meter. So you still have some potential energy there. And then you go to do the, the next part here, and then you have to work out, you know, uh, what the springs... I mean, you can do it. It's just a lot of extra work, and it's unnecessary. So one of the things I hope you get out of this lecture is, is really understanding how the energy transformations look and how to determine the before and after pictures and, and try to realize how intermediate steps um, don't matter a lot, again, if you don't have any loss of energy in that process, okay? So that's the end of the lecture here, um, and we'll get to the second rule soon. Bye.